Hi, I'm Paul Taylor from Mode 7. We're the company behind Frozen Synapse and the forthcoming futuristic sports strategy extravaganza Frozen Endzone. Earlier this year, I wrote a blog post called How to Be an Indie Game Developer. It was basically a response to the fact that I get a lot of email asking very general questions about game development, things like, I have an idea for a game, what would you advise I do next? Um, I decided to make a video to make some of the advice I give back a little bit more accessible. Um, I want to start by saying that I don't have the answers to this question myself. I think the the only thing I can offer really is just a set of things from my own experience that might spur you to have ideas and some specific suggestions that might help. Every indie game developer is different. Indie game development is a creative enterprise and should reflect your own personality and be done in the way that you want to do it. But having said that, um, as I said, it can be interesting to talk to other indies and hear what they have to say. So if this is your first encounter with that, I hope it's useful. A um, little bit of background on us. We started formally in 2005. We released a flying sword fighting game called Determinants in 2007, and that was basically a massive failure. It took four years uh, to make. We, we started kind of just as a group of friends, really, before we, we'd even formed a company. Um, it was a massively overambitious game. Various aspects of it weren't up to scratch, so it didn't resonate with people and it didn't sell particularly well, it didn't get Steam distribution and so on. So we started off from the standpoint of learning how to make a game with a big ambitious title that was a failure. We then, off the back of that, started to get offers for contract work and that was what sustained us largely contract work, um, contract programming, freelance writing for me um, for a while while we were working on Frozen Synapse. Uh, Frozen Synapse turned out very differently, it sold over half a million copies it won the IGF Audience Awards, got 9 out of 10 from Eurogamer, Destructoid and Edge, so we definitely viewed that as a success. What that means is that I have the perspective of having worked on something that really didn't work at all, having to struggle, having to phone up magazines to try and get coverage, right through to something which has definitely opened a lot of doors for us and has created a sustainable company. My role in the company is a dual one. I have some development roles, so I do audio, music and sound design all myself. Um, and also all the writing for our games. I get involved with things like art direction, um, certainly a lot on the polishing side of interfaces and the way the game is presented is generally sort of down to my direction, although now I work with Richard Whitelock, who's a very talented uh, artistic director. Um, I also get involved with some things like some aspects of single player design. And as a co-owner of the company, I work with our lead programmer and designer and the other co-owner Ian Hardingham on some of the higher level decisions about games and about what the company is doing in general. So I come at this from the perspective of someone who doesn't code and doesn't design and there are places in indie games for people like that. I think a lot of people will focus on the lone indie developer, the coder, designer, maybe someone who does art themselves. And of course that's extremely cool and that's a really great way to make stuff if you have all those talents. But even if you don't, I think there's a lot happening within indie games, certainly at the moment, that will kind of allow you to um, have a role there even if you don't do any of those things. So I've given you some caveats and I, I think I want to give you another one. Just because someone's worked on a title that's had some success, it doesn't necessarily mean that they have anything to tell you. There's a good book called Fooled by Randomness, which talks a lot about survivorship bias. So if you take a big random pool of people who are attempting something, some of them will become successful largely down to luck, and they're not going to have anything interesting to tell you about the process of how they got to where they are. Having said that, I think there are a few things that will really help you in terms of making a game and getting it out into the marketplace. In this video, I'm going to primarily deal with designing a game and the process of developing it. And in the next video, I'm going to talk more about marketing it, getting it out to people, and all of those things that indie developers don't tend to want to do very much. Right, that's more than enough preamble. Let's look at actually developing a game. Now, when you think about game development, you think about various different disciplines. And apologies if this is breathtakingly obvious, but some of this is useful to break down. So you've got design, you've got code, you've got art and animation, audio and music, and uh, writing, as well as level design, which I count as a more sort of tactical, lower level form of design. Now, some people, as I mentioned, can do all of that themselves, which is fantastic. If you can't, I think it's a good idea to focus on the things that you're best at and then outsource the rest. If you've never considered outsourcing or having anyone else work for you, um, 
there's a book which is quite interesting called The Four Hour Work Week, which is basically about how one person outsourced everything from their life that they didn't like doing. Um, it's very sort of, it's quite tongue in cheek and it's quite extreme in the way it presents its views. But I think if you've never had any contact with that idea, it could be a good thing to read to sort of get into your head just the fact that other people can do things for you at a good rate and it can work. Um, so let's go through each area and talk a little bit about it and we'll start with design, which is the absolute fundament of all games basically. Um, design is a creative and analytical discipline. There's something about it that makes people believe they can instantly do it even if they've never done it before. I think it's because a lot of people play games and they're very opinionated about them and they think, oh, if I could just add this or tweak this element of this game, then I could create a much better design than the designer. I think when you start to get into design, you realise what a fine balance everything is and that some mechanics that aren't necessarily as instantly attractive are there for a reason and so on. So the best thing to do with design is really to start doing it. Um, there are kind of three ways that you can do design. You can make games and watch other people play those games. You can read about game design theory and you can play other games analytically. Now I would put those in the following order. It's massively important to start making games and having other people play them. That's really, really the main thing that you should be doing. Then there's a really long gap. I'd say after that, studying other games analytically is best. And finally, reading about or studying game design theory, I would put at the bottom. Now, all of those things can be useful, but making the games, doing the practical side of it is by far the most useful of those. Um, game design is a very personal and specific thing. I think you need to find your own path in it. Two people I'd recommend reading on this are Derek Yu, who is the designer of the amazing Spelunky, which is one of the greatest game designs of the last 10 years. And also Tom Francis, who designed the amazing, amazing indie game Gunpoint, which just kind of came out of nowhere and sold huge numbers of copies and was massively popular and influential. Both of those guys are very articulate and they've both written blogs. Derek Yu specifically has a really nice kind of illustrated guide to making a game that I really recommend, just to kind of give you some parameters. One of the things uh, Derek says in his post is that you have to find the intersection between something you want to make, something you think should be made, and something that you can make. And that's a very difficult thing that you will have to figure out over time. As I said, with our first title, we didn't really know that. So that was kind of about establishing that for ourselves. Um, prototype your game first. I've seen so many work in progress projects from either younger developers or new teams where they have a load of art assets, they might have a fully working level, and the game mechanics are just really wonky or almost not there at all. Once you have a prototype, you can then figure out the way to aesthetically flesh out that prototype and it means you have solid game mechanics there first. Prototypes can look like absolutely anything, they can look horrible. The prototype for Frozen Synapse was something that I like to call wonky triangle wars, which was just a load of kind of very badly drawn triangles running around inside buildings. If your game doesn't look like that at the start, then I have a slight concern about your design process because you've got to get those fundamental mechanics in first. No matter how much I say this to people, it never seems to go in and it's very tempting to start adding things. There is a point in design where you need to start adding art assets in order to get more of the feel of the game going, but that can be after quite a long time of designing with a very bare bones prototype. So those are my key design recommendations, but just get out there and start doing it. Um, in terms of the actual practical way that you should go about making games, I think this crosses over into the coding section, which I'm going to talk about next. But there are a lot of tools out there that will enable you to get started with game design pretty quickly. Game Maker is a really good one. Uh, that was used to make Gunpoint and Spelunky, the two games I mentioned already. So do have a look at that. Um, also, there's things like Twine, which if you want to make an HTML based or text based game or quite a simple game, that's a really, really good way of getting started. You don't have to do any programming specifically, but it really teaches you some principles about being logical in a way that's useful for game design in general. So that could be a good thing to look into. Um, similarly, RenPy, which is something that's used to make visual novels. Again, that can be used to make a whole variety of different games. At a slightly higher end position, you've got Unity, which has Unity 2D now. Uh, and a lot of people find that really good for making their first games. Mike Bithell, who made Thomas Was Alone, started off learning to make games basically in Unity um, and has found that that's sort of set him in good stead to do further work in that engine. So that's another one to look at. I'm going to talk about coding now. 
I think it's important to really kind of clarify your goals with design so that you can aim to learn the technical stuff that you need. Um, I'm not a coder myself, so I asked Ian Hardingham, who is an amazing coder, to give me some advice on coding for new games coders. So I'm actually going to read what he said now. I'm going to assume you're working with an existing game engine if you're already reading out how to get into games coding piece. If you're rolling your own, then you're already beyond my advice. Learning to program is something which requires the kind of focus and effort which most programmers by nature don't have or can't muster. Um, so it's always a hard road. I advise the same approach, whether you've never programmed before in your life, as with me, you have a coding background, but are suddenly presented with a hugely complex 500,000 line game engine you have no idea what to do with. Don't bother starting small, go straight for what you actually want to do and start doing it. However, within that extremely ambitious framework, you must be intelligent about what part you want to start with. Find a self-contained part of the larger project, something which is achievable in a month with a real payoff and set that as your first target. Run headfirst flailing into the code base and hack away until you can make something change. Change something's colour and then celebrate. Badger people in the community for your game engine endlessly. Your questions will start off stupid and they'll be exasperated with you, but every day your questions will get slightly less ridiculous and eventually you'll be helping other people. If there are books available for your chosen engine, buy them and read them to co cover to cover without doing any of the actual coding exercises first. Only then should you start doing the coding exercises. Assuming you have any kind of natural talent for programming at all, and if you have none, maybe you should go for the art side of dev, uh, then the only real enemy you will have is uncertainty. Don't ever go into a problem with an attitude of, I don't know what to do, or even worse, I don't know if this is possible. Everything you'll be trying to do is possible, and if you're confident of that, you'll find everything much easier. Learning game programming is as hard as learning anything else. Expect it to take six months of very hard graft to get to any kind of position of knowledge. Now that's kind of a lot to take in initially, but I would really say that if you're serious about game development, then you will have to learn some kind of coding or scripting. Even with Twine, which I mentioned, which is one of the simplest ways of making games that exist, you soon find there are things that the basic engine uh, can't do that you really want, even if it's just like a little tweak to text or something like that, and you'll find that you'll sort of dive headlong into scripting. I would just say take Ian's advice and don't be intimidated by how difficult it can seem to start with. Try to have an effect, and as soon as you start learning that you can have an effect without too much effort, I think you'll find that you can go quite a long way. Right, I'm going to slightly change tack now and talk about the intersection between design and what people want to actually buy and play. Now, this is pretty contentious, and I suspect this is one of the areas where you can get into disagreements between various people who call themselves indie developers. The term means different things to different people. One of the most important things about the indie developer community, because that's something you may find yourself involved with if you start down this road, is a diversity of perspectives. There are some people who really are not interested in the commercial side of games at all, want to make games either for free or they want to just put them out at a nominal price that they think is okay and just leave the rest of the sort of buying purchasing stuff up to other people. There is nothing wrong with that. I mean, there's transparently nothing wrong with that. It's creative endeavor. There shouldn't be constraints on it in that way. Um, there are other people who want to make small companies or want to make games that perhaps have more success to a wider mainstream base. And that's completely okay as well, because there's nothing wrong with making something that people like. Certainly if you look at something like Minecraft, Minecraft has a lot of the hooks in it for popularity that kind of came about through, I'm not gonna say naive, but certainly a, a creative game design perspective. You can have integrity as a designer and still make something popular. It's just something that I personally believe. So talking about concepts, I think there are a few things that are quite important if you want people to pay attention to your game. Firstly, as I said before, you do have to work on something that you actually love, that you're passionate about. I don't think anyone can really approach indie games from a completely cynical point of view and just design a perfectly marketable concept and make that. You just won't survive if you don't love what you're doing. If you don't love what you're doing, it won't turn out well and it probably won't sell well anyway. So there's no point approaching it from a cynical perspective. When you're looking at a concept though, I think differentiation is massively important at the moment. Why am I talking about this now and not in the business section? Well, when you're starting out, deciding what you want to make has to fit in somewhere. I've seen a lot of good games recently which are very generic and they're just instantly compared to something else. And I don't think anyone wants that with 
their games. You have to find a niche that works. There are a lot of roguelike games around at the moment, for example, so if you're making a roguelike, it has to stand out. If you're making a roguelike and it's a dungeon crawler, you're really stuck because there's millions of games like that now where the gamer and journalists are going to look at your game and go, well, what does it do that's better than all of these things? If you pick an area that is underexplored, that doesn't have a lot of other titles in it, certainly new titles coming out, then you can have an innate advantage, which is that you don't necessarily have the immediate comparisons. People compare everything by nature. If you make something and it looks slightly like something else, they will think of that thing absolutely first, even if your gameplay is completely unrelated to it. Say I made a, a space game that was about primarily economics and trading. Um, if it looked like X-Wing, people would say, oh, it's X-Wing. It's a remake of X-Wing. Even if the gameplay was totally different from X-Wing, that's a problem that you're gonna have. So you've got to, at the creative stage, think about how you're gonna differentiate from other things. I think that's a good creative principle as well as a good commercial one. But you might just say, I'm gonna ignore all that and just make the Zelda clone, the pixel perfect Zelda clone that I want to make. And if that's what you wanna do, then don't let me stop you. Moving on from macro design and kind of concepts down to the lowest level of design, which is level design. The only thing I really want to say about this is that I think a lot of people massively underestimate how long it takes. If you're making something like a shooter where level design is basically almost the entire game, then you're going to have to spend a long time tweaking and crafting levels to exactly you know reflect the gameplay as best you can. I think level design is a good thing to get someone to help you with if you possibly can. We have a dedicated level designer, Robin Bin Cox, who some of you may have uh, encountered on the Frozen Synapse server and elsewhere. And he does a great job because he's able to really focus on that minute detail of level design that Ian, who is designing all the game mechanics, really doesn't have time to do, um, especially as he's sort of coding and doing other things as well. So that's an area that can really benefit from some support. But all I would say is just don't underestimate how hard it is. Again, Gunpoint is a good reference point for that. I think Tom wrote a really good blog about just how hard level design is and how time consuming it is. So that's enough about that. Art and animation, the second big part of games. And it's the part of games that people see first. It's really easy to think, and we still do this, we're still guilty of this. If you have these great mechanics, people will instantly love your game. And that's, that's not true. They won't instantly love your game. They'll love your game if they get to the point where they're really properly experiencing the mechanics. But art and animation is the gateway into that. This is something that a lot of indie games have a big problem with, and it's a, it's a really common flaw, which is that the art is either designed to kind of fit into a specific box, so it's kind of pixel arty, or it's like weird and wacky looking, but it doesn't reflect the gameplay in the right way, or it excludes people, it doesn't lead them in in quite the right way. Um, a game that actually does this well with very minimal art is Dwarf Fortress. If you look at Dwarf Fortress, which is ASCII based, you immediately know that it's going to be fiendishly complicated, that it's going, you can barely read the screen of Dwarf Fortress unless you don't know what you're looking at. And that really suits the game because the kind of people who want to play that are the kind of people who want to really immerse themselves in an extremely deep and complex system. So even though you might not be able to afford amazing art, having art that tells a story of your game is extremely important. I think that's one of the things that we've managed to do right with Frozen Synapse. Frozen Synapse is really about very specific tactics and positioning. And the kind of neon interface look that we gave the game really reflects that. So it draws in the kind of people who are attracted by a very mechanically foregrounded tactics game, not a tactics game that kind of is realistic and feels like you're in a SWAT team or whatever. That would be a different kind of presentation. So I guess what I'm trying to say here is just make sure the two match up and money doesn't have to be everything with art. There are a lot of very polished indie games coming out, particularly some of the UDK games that just look absolutely amazing. And you may not be able to hit that straight away, but we're really still in, I guess, what people are calling a new golden age of indie games because you don't have to have that level of cost to compete with those games. Um, certainly very pared down art styles could work. Now, again, art is something that's good to outsource. There are quite a few discussion boards and places around on the internet where you can contact freelance artists and view their portfolios. And there are a lot of artists out there. 
One thing that can be good is finding out who the freelancers were who worked on various different games and contacting them to see if they're available and they can work for you. I think you'll find that um, if you're sensitive to it and you, you are intelligent about how you talk to people, you'll find things like negotiating rates and figuring out what you can afford to pay people it can be quite an organic process and a fair one. I think people tend to view negotiation as a sort of dirty word um, or a, a, about exploiting other people and I don't think it has to be like that. I think both people need to represent themselves well. Both people need to be clear about what their goals are. Maybe an artist is willing to work for a bit less at a specific time because either they need work or the work is a bit easier for them to do than at other times. And maybe they'll be honest about that and say, look, I can give you a slightly better rate than I would normally. If you're the person commissioning the art, you can genuinely say, look, I have X budget. Is there anything you can do for that? And you can work on, on those terms. So it should be about meeting in the middle in terms of a collaboration, because if you find a good person, you're going to want to work with them again and you're going to want their business to be sustainable as well as yours. So try to find a middle ground. You may have no money to start with and you may be forced into a position where you have to get people to work for free or you have to do everything yourself. That can work. Um, as long as your goals are aligned. I would say always try to get a formal arrangement in place. People working for free often give up when it's hard and sometimes they don't tell you that they've given up and that can be absolutely deadly. You know, you can expect someone to be working on something and suddenly they disappear and you're stuck with a load of half finished art assets or whatever. That can be really, really difficult. So if you can afford to do it, I do recommend trying to pay people a good rate to work on art for you specifically. Um, but your circumstances may differ. In terms of actual art direction, um, as I said before, I think keeping it simple, keeping it directed are good. Focusing on aesthetic reward is very important. Um, a lot of the time we play games to get a specific feeling when we do something well. One really good reference point for this is Blizzard. Blizzard are absolute masters of aesthetic reward. Even something like Hearthstone, the way the cards sparkle, the way the particle effects go off when you win, the, the sound effect that accompanies that as well. Um, even the smallest action feels rewarding and robust because of the art direction of those games. So do have a look at that. And this is a good point in general. Don't be afraid to look to AAA games for inspiration. Not necessarily, you know, direct inspiration like I want my characters to look like Assassin's Creed characters or whatever, but just how they do simple things, how they highlight things to a player, how they tell a story, how they reward the player. That's very, very important. Final points with art really two things. Front load the awesome. If the first thing on the screen looks good, even if it's just the title screen, even if it's just the menu, people are going to be drawn into your games. I've been judging in the IGF this year and the first thing you see on a game really makes that huge difference to you, especially if you're looking at lots of games at once. It's something that people neglect. I've seen a lot of bad title screens, I've seen a lot of you know boring movies or ugly menus, ugly UIs just really makes a huge difference. And it can just be little things, just like having a nice highlight on buttons, having a glow effect on some text, having a scrolling background instead of a static one. Little tiny things um, can make a really, really big difference. So remember that someone is in the experience of your game from the moment they load it up. And that goes to the final point I wanna make about art, which is polish. It is worth doing all those little things. It's worth aligning buttons correctly, it's worth checking for capital letters, it's worth making sure things are the right size, because polish is an accumulation of small details, it's layers and layers and layers of microscopic changes. And when you're doing polishing, you need to switch off all the parts of your brain which are helping you get stuff done, all of the, this is hard, I'm gonna leave it to later stuff, and you need to just go through everything meticulously, step by step, looking for problems. Have a really cynical, Imagine you're the most annoying YouTube comment commenter who's ever existed, the most judgmental, pathetic person on the face of the earth, because these people are going to get hold of your game. If you put yourself in that mindset and you crawl through your game looking for problems, then you'll find some and you'll get to the point where you can finish them. Restrict that to just minor aesthetic things that you can change, not fundamental things. Um, don't go through and start criticizing the fundaments of your game at the polishing stage. Just divide those two things up and do your polishing later on with that really anal attitude basically. 
Um, I want to talk about music and audio quickly. That obviously this is very close to my heart, um, as I've written the music for all of our games, and uh, music was one of the ways that I got into game development. I think it's really underutilized in a lot of games at the moment. Although I would say that music, certainly in the indie games scene, has improved enormously over the time, certainly that I've been working. Um, I think. If you can't do this yourself, really try and find a good person. There are so many musicians out there looking for work. There are so many high quality people out there. Uh, personally, I don't like dynamic music. I don't like music that's just designed as kind of extra sound design to ramp up emotions. I like things with tunes. Um, I like classic game music. I think there's a lot of inspiration out there. And you can go so far with music that has a nice melody and that people can remember and, and sing and you know listen to when they're working. Um, it always makes me really happy when someone says something like, oh, I put the whole Frozen Sign Up soundtrack on today while I was coding, or you know, I did my university essay listening to your tracks. That's something that I want for all of our game soundtracks. It's just specifically my style. You may be a more ambient composer or you may want that kind of thing and that can work as well. But just pay some attention to the music in your game. Um, there's things like Game Music Bundle now. You can even get extra revenue streams from selling music. So having something that's high quality uh, and that really stands out is, is certainly worth it. Similarly, sound design. There are a lot of great freelance sound designers around. It, it shouldn't be difficult for you to find one um, to work on your game and it really does make a huge amount of difference to both the atmosphere and the impact that your game can have. So audio is unfortunately, uh, I would say, the least important discipline in game development still, but it can play this really, really vital role that can really change the nature of your game. Um, if you're thinking about doing some music yourself, which I definitely recommend, uh, my sort of basic recommendations for stuff to do would be to have a look at Ableton Live. I think that's a really good piece of music software. It comes, it's expensive, but it comes bundled with a lot of stuff and it's really kind of infinitely expandable. Uh, you can use all kinds of plugins with it that are really good. Um, I actually like the Native Instruments complete audio interface. I was just looking over there to make sure I could remember what it was called. Uh, that's quite a good sort of simple, really robust interface that will get you going. It's just USB, plug it straight in and off you go uh, and get a MIDI keyboard. And then you can start bashing away on basic synthesizers and making music to your heart's content. Uh, it would be cool to see some more people getting involved with making their own music for games, especially if you're one of these lone gun creators. Uh, give it a go. Finally, I'm going to talk about writing in games. Uh, a lot of games don't have writing, and I think that's quite a good choice given the level of some of the writing that we're seeing. A few things I learned from working on Frozen Synapse, um, I want to expand this into probably another video at some point, but keeping things concise, keeping them targeted, giving the player exposition so that they know what they're doing. The first draft of Frozen Synapse was very enigmatic and people actually wanted front-loaded exposition. They wanted to know why they were doing things in the world, who they were in the world and what was going on almost instantly. So you've got to give the player at least some cues to doing that. Um, a game that came out recently that, that's really well written, that gives the players a lot, play a lot of in interesting cues is The Stanley Parable. It plays with narrative a lot. Gone Home, similarly, is one of the greatest narrative games ever made. So if, you, if you're looking for writing inspiration within games, I would have a look at how those two games kind of control and shape the user experience through words, um, as well as atmosphere and level design. Writing should work in tandem with the rest of the game, um, and it should really be there to support things rather than sort of off on its own, ballooning out into great literary worlds of text. So uh, do bear that in mind. Yet again, there are plenty of writers out there that you could consider hiring. Um, if you're trying to write things yourself, then just be careful uh, and get other people to look at what you're doing to verify that it actually is worthwhile. So that concludes my sort of first rant about game development really. Um, I'll be back with more advice about releasing a game, publicizing it, getting it out to the market. But if you're thinking of making an indie game, do go for it, use the resources that are out there, get in contact with other indie developers. A lot of us are pretty friendly on Twitter. Um, you can get my Twitter from the description of this video. Just say hello, show us your early projects and good luck.